something? Yes, I do. <laughs> no, it's fine. Thank you. And good afternoon. Yeah, today I would like to present you the results of my PhD. And I will start with the short introduction of uh, European bison. So, um, in historical times, the range of European bison covered Western, Central and Southeastern Europe. However, habitat fragmentation and overhunting eradicated most of these populations. And by the end of the 19th century, there were only two populations of European bison left in the wild. It was a population of lowland bison belonging to Bison bonazus bonazus subspecies in the Białowieża forest. And the second was a population of Caucasian bison belonging to Bison bonazus caucasicus subspecies in the uh, Caucasus mountains. However, even these populations collapsed and the last wild lowland bison was killed in 1919. And the same fate happened to Caucasian bison eight years later. Due to this dramatic situation of European bison, the International Society for the Protection of the European Bison was established and the successful restitution process began. The gene pool of modern bison originates from just 12 founders bred in reserves and zoological gardens. 11 of them belong to lowland subspecies and there was only one bull, Caucasus, representing Caucasian line. The modern heads are managed as two separate genetic lines. The lowland line, which originate from seven founders and include putatively pure lowland bison, and the lowland Caucasian line, which originate from all 12 founders, including the Caucasian bull. So the aims of our project were to track changes in genetic variability through the European bison extinction and their subsequent restitution but also to investigate admixture between European bison subspecies and between European bison and the boss cattle lineage. To realize mentioned aims, we have generated low coverage genomic data from two now extinct Caucasian bison, which I will call CC1 and CC2. We have also generated low coverage genomic data from two lowland bison from the initial breeding population, Planta and her son Platen, which both I will call founders. And we have also generated uh, low coverage genomic data from three modern bison from both genetic lines, from lowland line, from Polish and Belarusian part of Białowieża forest, and from single um, lowland Caucasian bison from Bieszczady mountains. So to generate this data set, we used the newest technology and that's the workflow. So DNA extraction, then the library preparation, and cluster generation and sequencing. Those two steps are done by the sequencer. And data processing and data analysis, the longest step. So now I will briefly describe uh, each of the steps. I started with DNA extraction, and um, I extracted ancient or archival DNA, as you prefer in a dedicated ancient DNA uh, lab in Potsdam University. Some people distinguish between ancient and archival DNA, and then ancient DNA means DNA extracted from archaeological or paleontological specimens, while archival DNA is the DNA extracted from much younger specimens, like museum specimens. So I extracted archival DNA from horns and skull bones, so first you have to drill it and then you uh, digest the, the powder with the proper digestion buffer, proteinase K and DTT. The next step is library preparation. A library is the collection of DNA fragments of particular length with adapters attached to both ends. And there are two types of adapters, P5 and P7. Adapters contain regions complementary to the oligos on the flow cell but also contain primer binding sites for uh, read one, read two, and uh, for index one, uh, and sometimes it's also index two. Index is a sample specific barcode, and thanks to that, sequences from pooled uh, sample libraries can be separated. So I constructed two types of libraries depending on the age of the sample. And for modern samples, I constructed double-stranded libraries. And for archival samples, I constructed single-stranded libraries. The overall idea is similar, but in double-stranded libraries, adapters are attached to double-stranded molecules. 
while in single-stranded libraries, double-stranded molecule is, uh, is first heat denatured to single-stranded molecules, and each single-stranded mo molecule serves as a template for further steps. And there are some advantages of using single-stranded library preparation over double-stranded library preparation. The first advantage is that you avoid the loss of molecules in DNA purification steps. Because thanks to initial biotinylation, which occurred here, DNA is tightly bound to streptavidin coated beads. And the second advantage is that molecules with single strand breaks or with end modifications are entirely lost in double stranded library preparation. Whereas in single stranded library preparation, each single stranded molecule has an independent chance of being recovered in the library. The next step is clustering. Uh, clustering is a process where each fragment of the DNA uh, library is amplified. And the whole process takes place on the flow cell. That's the flow cell from NextSeq 500. So it's a glass with, in this case, four lanes. And each lane is a channel coated with two types of oligos. As I told you before, adapters contain regions complementary to the oligos on the flow cell. And thanks to that, oligos and adapters hybridize. And then, through bridge amplification, uh, fragments are amplified, forming clusters. Sequencing begins with the introduction of sequencing primer for read one. And this primer is complementary to region of the adapter. Then read one sequence is generated, and in paired end sequencing, also uh, sequencing primer for read two is introduced, and read two sequence is generated. And the whole process generates millions of reads representing all the fragments. I used NextSeq 500, so I got up to 400 million single end reads and up to 800 million paired and reads. So that's a lot of data that you have to process. And that's how raw data from the sequencer looks like, and that's the useful FastQ format. So I converted raw data to FastQ format by using BCL to FastQ. Then reads were trimmed, merged, mapped to the reference genome. I removed duplicate reads by uh, using some tools RMDUP software. And the final step was pseudohaploidization. So I generated pseudohaploid sequences by selecting a random, single, quite high quality nucleotide from the read stack at each position of the reference genome. And this procedure disregards heterozygous positions because only one allele is sampled, but also does not introduce any biases because it's a random process. And that's how I generated data that I used for further analysis. Uh, I estimated genomic divergence within European bison and also between European bison and domestic cattle and yak. And genomic alignments were divided into non-overlapping one megabase blocks. And for each block with sufficient data, we uh, estimated proportion of transversions or transitions plus transversions and then uh, we generated probability densities in R. We have also applied a novel approach, which we call a uh, nuclear genome phylogenetic test. This is a test involving five taxa. And again, genomic alignments were divided into non-overlapping one megabase blocks. And for each block with sufficient data, we computed maximum likelihood phylogeny. And we tested the following uh, trees. So by testing the first tree, we wanted to examine the issue of either monophyly or paraphyly of Caucasian bison. We wanted uh, also to identify genomic blocks resulting from Caucasian bison admixture in modern lowland Caucasian and in modern lowland bison. And we also wanted to identify domestic cattle uh, um, blocks resulting from domestic cattle admixture in modern uh, lowland bison. We investigated admixture by using this statistic test of admixture, also called ABA-BABA test. This is a test involving four genomes. 
genome from each of two sister populations, genome from the third population, which is a potential source of introgress genome, and the outgroup genome to identify the ancestral state. So we look um, across the genomes and we look for particular types of position that first show variation and second there are two possible variants in these positions which I will call A and B. A, like ancestral, means the condition shown by the outgroup and B means any condition that is different to the outgroup so therefore must be derived. And these positions create uh, ABBA BABA patterns which can be produced by two processes. The first one is incomplete lineage sorting and we assume that it occurs when numbers of ABBA and BABA sites are equal and then this statistic value which is estimated from this equation is equal to zero. And the second process is admixture when we observe any imbalance in frequency of these positions across the complete genome. And the excess of ABBA sites relative to BABA sites results in positive values. And alternatively, the excess of BABA sites relative to ABBA sites results in negative D values. So now some results. So uh, we uh, track changes in genetic variability in the European bison population in, uh, before and after restitution by estimating genomic divergence within European bison. And these are resulting probability densities between and among modern and founding bison. That's between Caucasian bison CC1 and both modern and founding bison. And that's between Caucasian bison CC2 and all remaining bison. So as you can see, genomic divergence among modern and founding bison is broadly similar. And genomic divergence between Caucasian bison and both modern and founding bison greatly exceeds that occurring between the latter two groups. However, one of the Caucasian bison, CC1, is less diverged from uh, modern and founding bison than Caucasian bison CC2, suggesting substantial genetic diversity, but also population structure in the extinct Caucasian bison um, uh, subspecies. We have also estimated genomic divergence between European bison and domestic cattle and yak as the issue of low genetic variability among living populations is considered as possible concern and has been inferred by several population level studies using different markers. However, in uh, apparent contrast to previous results, we found that genomic divergence among modern bison, that's the red line, is similar to that found among domestic cattle, that's the black line, and greatly exceeds that found among yak. Uh, we also found that uh, distribution of genomic divergence among pairs of bison is bimodal. You can see two humps here and two humps here. So this bimodal distribution suggests that among any pair of bison, large blocks of chromosomes will show high genetic similarity, and that's the result of inbreeding. We have also investigated mitochondrial genome variability among all individuals and we found that all investigated here um, modern bison founders and one of the Caucasian bison, CC1, share a single haplotype and the second Caucasian bison, CC2, uh, differed from this widely shared haplotype by a single uh, transition site. So this result indicates a major loss of mitochondrial haplotype diversity prior to the extinction of European bison in the wild. Then we tested the issue of either monophyly or paraphyly of Caucasian bison by using the novel approach that I described before. And we found that 57% of investigated genomic blocks suggested in the reciprocal monophyly of modern lowland bison and Caucasian bison However, 26% of these blocks suggested paraphyly of Caucasian bison. Also, neighbor joining tree based on total nuclear genomic divergence suggested paraphyly of Caucasian bison. So, in this situation, we concluded that Caucasian bison are most likely monophyletic. However, among any two modern bison and among any two Caucasian bison, we may expect that any single locus has around 50% probability of reflecting the true history of population divergence. 
And also, this result emphasized the fact that interpretation of phylogeny based even on the complete genomes may be inappropriate. And sometimes more flexible models like that one presented here are more uh, proper. We investigated admixture by using this statistic test of admixture and uh, I performed in total over 100 comparisons and here I'm presenting only the most relevant results. So along the horizontal axis I presented different D values and all three topologies I presented in that way that D values are positive, suggesting excess of ABBA sites relative to BABA sites. Uh, as the outgroup, I used uh, water buffalo genome, which is not shown on the, on the figure. And statistically significant results I highlighted in red, non-significant in gray. So first I checked genetic contribution of founders to modern uh, bison. And I found higher genetic contribution of founders to modern lowland bison than to modern lowland Caucasian bison, which we could expect as the signal from lowland founders in modern lowland Caucasian line was diluted by the contribution of the Caucasian bull Caucasus. Then we uh, checked admixture uh, between Caucasian bison relative to platen, which proved to be the purest lowland bison. And here I'm presenting results for eight three topologies. So it's going to be platen, planta, CC1, platen, planta, CC2, and so on. And the results were not significant only for platen, planta, CC1, um, three topology. For all remaining three topologies, these statistic values suggested gene flow between Caucasian bison, and all investigated here, modern bison, and foundress planta. Then we checked admixture between Caucasian bison and modern lowland Caucasian bison, as there was Caucasian bison in the founding herd of this line. And, they and we found that modern lowland Caucasian bison share an excess of derived allele with Caucasian bison CC1, but not with Caucasian bison CC2 uh, relative to modern lowland bison. So we concluded that the last surviving Caucasian bison, Caucasus, whose living descendants comprised the modern lowland Caucasian line, was more closely related to Caucasian bison CC1 than to Caucasian bison CC2. And finally, we investigated admixture between European bison and either domestic cattle or aurochs. And we found that all investigated here European bison share an excess of direct allele with domestic cattle relative to aurochs. However, we didn't reject the alternative hypothesis that European bison were admixed with aurochs, but we just don't have power to detect this admixture signal. Then we further investigated uh, Caucasian bison ancestry in the genome of modern lowland Caucasian bison. We wanted to identify parts of the genome resulting from Caucasian bison admixture. And that's what we prepared, genomic admixture map of Caucasian bison ancestry in this modern lowland Caucasian bison. Colored blocks indicate one megabase genomic blocks returning alternative tree topologies. Blue blocks are compatible with the species tree which is presented here. Yellow blocks uh, suggested monophyly of modern lowland Caucasian and Caucasian bison, which likely result from admixture and to a lesser extent from incomplete lineage sorting. And red blocks suggested um, uh, monophyly of platen and Caucasian bison, which likely result from incomplete lineage sorting. X shows blocks with missing uh, data. And the pie chart shows the percentage of genomics blocks uh, supporting each tree topology. So we found that 22% of investigated genomic blocks suggested monophyly of modern lowland Caucasian and Caucasian bison. And these blocks may, de may therefore represent introgress segments of Caucasian bison uh, ancestry in the genome of this modern lowland Caucasian bison. However, 8% of these blocks are likely to result from incomplete lineage sorting. So 13% of the genome of this modern lowland Caucasian bison results from Caucasian bison admixture, probably Caucasus. And um, this method is also able to accurately map admixed segments of the genome. 
And as you can see, we observe variance in admixture proportion along the chromosomes. So, for example, on chromosome 4, there is um, a contiguous 22 megabase genomic block, which may span to 33 megabase when we assume that uh, intervening blocks with missing data are linked to uh, adjacent ones, while on chromosome 27, there's a single admixed block. Then we investigated evidence of Caucasian bison ancestry in the modern lowland bison. Modern lowland bison shared an excess of derived allele with Caucasian bison relative to founders. So modern lowland bison appeared to be more admixed with Caucasian bison than founders. So this admixture signal could result from either variable admixture proportion among founders or recent gene flow between modern lowland and lowland Caucasian bison. And we further investigated this alternative hypothesis by comparing the sizes of putatively admixed genomic blocks. In the case of recent gene flow between modern lowland and lowland Caucasian bison, we expected that the sizes of putatively admixed genomic blocks in both lines should be similar. However, we found that plenty of these genomic blocks were considerably smaller in modern lowland bison than in modern um, lowland Caucasian bison. The largest block size detected in modern lowland Caucasian bison was 22 megabase, while in modern lowland bison was 8 megabase. And this result uh, supports the first hypothesis. And finally, we investigated evidence of domestic cattle ancestry in the modern um, lowland bison. Modern bison appeared to be more admixed with domestic cattle than founders. So we tested the possibility of recent gene flow between modern bison and domestic cattle. As you know, recent gene flow results in large contiguous genomic blocks derived from admixture in the genome of the recipients. And these blocks are gradually broken up by recombination. So in the case of recent gene flow between modern bison and domestic cattle, we expected to see large cattle admixed genomic blocks in the genome of modern bison. However, we didn't find even a single one megabase genomic block supporting the monophyly of modern lowland bison and domestic cattle, suggesting that the admixture between European bison and domestic cattle is more ancient and definitely occurred prior to the extinction of European bison in the wild. So, to conclude, our studies have revealed the complexity of European bison evolution and this complex history involved many admixture events, uh, resulting not only from the captive breeding program, and that's the gene flow from founders to modern bison or from Caucasian bison to modern lowland Caucasian bison, but also admixture between lowland and Caucasian bison, which occurred prior to the establishment of the captive breeding program, and also an ancient admixture between European bison and the boss cattle lineage. In our studies, we have also revealed that genomic divergence among modern and founding bison is similar to that found among domestic cattle and greater to that found among yak. So European bison captive breeding program appears to have succeeded in retaining reasonable level of genetic variability in um, modern populations. However, the extinction of Caucasian bison was clearly accompanied by a huge loss of diversity, which was indicated by this substantial pairwise nuclear genomic divergences between um, Caucasian and modern bison. In our studies, we have also developed new analytical methods for studying admixture, and by generating chromosomal admixture maps for multiple individuals from the lowland Caucasian line, at least in theory, it would be possible to selectively breed an animal that at the genomic level would be highly similar to a Caucasian bison. And this concept of species de-extinction may seem controversial, but it's also very popular now. And finally, our studies mm, demonstrate the huge potential of genomic approaches, in particular applied to historical samples, for studying evolutionary histories, but also for the conservation management of endangered species. 
uh, I would like to thank my supervisor, Professor Shomura, Michiel Freiter, and members of the groups for their help and support. But especially I would like to thank my friend, Axel Ballo, because he taught me a lot and without his help my project wouldn't be so valuable and exciting. I would also want to thank Upper Silesian Museum in Bitton for providing samples, National Science Center for funding my research, SET for travel grant, and finally, <coughs> I would like to thank you for coming and for your attention. Gracias. <laughs>